Good morning. Are we on? Yeah, they're in the door. Good morning, everybody. Can you please take your seats. So, welcome to the Ely Gospel Church once again. God bless you. Um, this one announcement is our sister Connie came home yesterday and her surgery went well. And of course, she's in pain with that back surgery. A lot, a lot was done, and uh, it was like about a five hour surgery or so. But she's home, and so just please keep her in your prayers. Um, these recoveries take a little bit more than we want them to sometimes, and we just got to deal with it. But still, I know prayer is helping them. And personally, I just want to thank everybody for praying for mine. And we're on the mend pretty well. My pain levels are very low. And um, yeah, so I think I think they'll be back in the saddle a lot sooner than the doctors tell me. Yes. <laughs> Lord so, willing. So anyway, thanks a lot for your prayers and, and for being here today. And I guess with that, I just want to open up with a word of prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor. Yeah. Or music. Music. Okay, then we'll get the worship team up here. I haven't done this part this for a long time. So anyway, Lord, we do thank you that we can assemble here today in your name, Lord, and we thank you that you gave us a nice church to attend here, Lord, and uh, with the... Um, a group of really good brothers and sisters here, Lord. It's, it's wonderful to be in unity with everybody. And uh, Lord, we know that's all possible because of who you are and the things that you teach us in this life, Lord. And we thank you for that. And um, now I ask, Lord, that you would bless our worship team as they come forward. And may we worship you in our way we reflect ourselves in community and other places that we go to it once we're outside the church, Lord. I just would pray that we would um, be the same out of church as we are in church and always keep you in the forefront of our minds with that. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to the worship team and close, please. How's everybody today? Good. Good. Are you ready to praise the Lord? Yes. 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 If you're not, it's okay. Sometimes we don't feel all ready. Sometimes our mind and our hearts are filled with all kinds of things, but um, but that's what this time is for. It's the time that we can um, enter into His presence. Um, music is powerful, and God uses it in amazing ways. And so we can enter in and let go of all the things that are um, swirling around in our head and our hearts. And we can reach up to the Lord during this time. And we can just ask the Lord, we ask him, you know, Jesus, Holy Spirit, to come, come and be in this place and minister to us. As we um, lift up our hearts and our voices and our hands to you. Minister to us, Lord Jesus. Bless this congregation. Bless the people that are here. You know, we pray for those that are um, not able to be here and those that are listening to uh, the internet to us. We bless them as well. We thank you, God, that you can be everywhere all at once and working in every heart. Thank you, Jesus. He is our hope.
We always have time. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share this morning? Scripture, something on your heart? Exhortation, encouragement? Ralph? Uh, well, I had to work through yesterday. On my wife's memorial here, I got a letter for all of us, my other children, and I got a letter from our youngest daughter, Bethonia. And said some very nasty things. Didn't want anything to do with us. And I'm very much in prayer over it. In two days I found out she just had an operation for sinuses, so it's too difficult. So I ordered her to send her the biggest bunch of flowers I had ever seen. And, I, and then I apologized. Didn't want to hurt her in any way. So yesterday we had our half, a, half an hour good conversation. Oh, of hatred. The hatred. We have no reason to hate anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I just said much in prayer over her every day. I just ought to have a woman to dialogue with the Lord. Anybody else? I'd like to share something. Um, for years, I always felt like I had to be perfect to God. I had to read the Bible, lots of chapters a day, do this, that, or other thing. I got it. And um, I talked to Pastor Tim a couple weeks ago, and there is such a diagnosis as religious. And that fit me perfectly. I felt like I had to do everything perfectly for God, otherwise, He wasn't going to love me or anything. You know, I was too perfect for Him. So I think that, I thank God for using Pastor Tim to minister to me about that because that gives me peace of mind. Saints, there's a Super Bowl party today and game and board games party or just visiting party. There, the football game will be up in the commons for those that want to watch the game, but there will be a time of eating together. It's a potluck uh, at 4.30. The game's at 5.30 for those that want to play board games down in the basement. So just uh, something for everyone if you want to come and hang out today for a time of fellowship and enjoying one another. Uh, it was in the email bulletin, but not everybody gets that, so that will be at 4.30 today. I'd like to pray quick before the uh, missionary speaker comes. Oh, but if our ushers could come. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, a few things today. I pray that your healing grace would be upon Connie, that she would get good and God speed in her uh, recuperation. I pray the same for Bernie. I pray, God, that you would give a quickening touch to his mortal body. And I pray, Father, that this would be a lasting surgery in the sense that it would, um, you know, it would stay strong and stable and, uh, and serve him now throughout the rest of his mortal days. Heavenly Father, I pray for a great spirit of fellowship this afternoon as we gather. Heavenly Father, it's, it's on my mind again today that you would heal any hurting hearts from young children to the oldest of parents, Lord God, that your balm, the balm of Gilead, would just be massaged deeply into any hurting place, that your love would heal all wounds and grant all reassurance. And ultimately and finally, Father, I pray according to Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 5, that the love of God would be poured into our hearts today by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
We thank you for the gifts of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Wicker baskets are for missions, and the wooden baskets are for offerings for the church. And Cindy has a, uh, a missionary report, and then, the, and then the kids' missionary march. You can... <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I think everybody can hear me without the mic. Should I pick it up again? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to tell, uh, kind of do a, a little bit of a story today. Um, in the fall, the, the missions team decided that we wanted to be a little more personal with all of the missionaries that we serve. So we each got a few of the missionaries and we contact them and talk to them and just say, we want to get to know you a little bit better. How are, you know, how are things going with you? What's going on in your life? And so uh, we decided that we were going to try to send a package to Eastern Europe to a young family who had a little boy and, and um, were expecting a baby. And we thought it'd be nice, just a personal thing. So we all decided on what we should bring. We put all kinds of things from here and there because I think they are from Minnesota originally. And uh, so anyway, we had like warm socks and we had stuff for the new baby and we had toys and we had stuff in there. So I, we got it all wrapped. I happily went over here to the postal area and they helped me. There's lots of paperwork, as you can imagine, to send anything to Eastern Europe. So. I was in there, we were working on it and filling all the things out. You have to put like the weight of each thing and how much you, it would cost and everything has to be on there. So we sent the box and then a few days later, I get a call from the end. She says, Cindy, there's a box here. And so I said, oh, okay. So I came over and I said, oh, it had a red marks on it. And it said something was wrong with the paperwork. So I took it back over to the postal place where I had been and we went through all the paperwork and redid the whole thing and then mailed it off and then two days later we get I get a call from the edge goes, Cindy, there's a box here. <laughs> so I said, okay, the box is here. So, and I've been praying over it that the box would get there. So anyway, I took it home because it, by that time it had been mailed so many places it was like open on the edges and so I rewrapped it, redid everything. I went to the little Babbitt post office and I said to the lady, we're really having a problem with this. We think that we can get this mailed and try, let's try again because we really want to get it. So in the meantime, the family that we were mailing it to, their baby was expected and they can't stay in their country and have the child there because they don't have the adequate facilities. So they had to go to Thailand. So they were traveling to Thailand. We're trying to get the box to them. So. We spent a long time in the post office and she wrote everything carefully down and she said to me, next time just mail a card. <laughs> so I said, okay. So anyway, it went. I, I was waiting for a call. I thought, well, I'm gonna do this 20 times 20 if I have to, but that box is getting over there. <laughs> so anyway, it didn't come back. I didn't hear anything and stuff for a while and I knew that they were in Thailand and so I'm, I'm praying, oh Lord, if the box gets there though then and they're gone for a while, where's it gonna go? And so anyway, it got there. So I'm gonna read you a little note we got from the family. Uh, <clears throat> so great to hear from you. We just made it back to our village and one of the first things we did was go to the post office to see if your package had arrived. It had. You officially got to be the first people to send us a package since we had moved to the village. It was so special and came at such a perfect time as we really were in need of encouragement. Transitions are hard and this one is no exception. We thank you and the other ladies at Bible study. You did an amazing job brainstorming things that would really make us feel loved. We love the combination of practical, thoughtful taste of our home state. Things for our son to enjoy thinking of his birthday, and encouraging words that were written. Lots of love, and please pass this on to everyone at Ely Gospel Tabernacle and everyone who helped make it possible. Love in Christ, Tim and Marie. Um, so I got there, 
And you know, it was so odd because the timing was really perfect. If it had got there at any different time, things could have worked out entirely differently. But as it was, it was waiting there when they got back. I mean, God's timing is perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, also I wanted to say that we get a lot of thank you letters from our missionaries all over, and every one of our missionaries right now are in difficult places. And they're working as hard as they can to get everything in their country done. I mean, there's uh, Bibles printed in Venezuela in every language they have there. They're, God, as God opens doors, they're quickly doing stuff in different parts of the country. Venezuela's in a mess. There, there are missionaries in Africa, that's a powder keg all the time. Eastern Europe is a powder keg. So they really need you guys to pray for them. Every time we get letters, they always say, thank you for your support, but please pray. That's the most important thing that covers them when times are rough. So that's our report. <clears throat> Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Thank you, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in the sun. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Yes, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Oh, and then, yes. Saints, if you would go ahead and turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. A little truth in lending for this sermon. This is really a part two. It can stand alone in some sense, but and I'll make enough mention of this that it can stand alone, but I just want to say that... Um, to properly understand the subject today, we need to first understand that God is love. Before he ever would command us to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to overflow in love to our neighbor, he first loves on us because he is love. And I just want to make sure that we know that we'll never muster this in our own strength. We first need to be touched by the love of God, and that's what we spoke about last week. In any event, this scripture reads thus. Jesus speaking, Mark chapter 12, verse 30. And it's just this one verse today, a couple verses, uh, one verse today. And you shall love the Lord your God uh, this is in response to the, the greatest commandment. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That's the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts today I pray that you would manifest the power that is mentioned in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. I pray that you would do quiet things in our heart, our mind, our emotions, our attitudes. I pray that you would do bold things. 
whispered things and celebrated, shouted things. Father, most of all, again, I ask that you would pour love into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. I can think of a lot of beautiful spiritual gifts and spiritual motivations and spiritual offices and fruit of the Spirit that would be lovely to see manifest. But maybe one of the greatest things I cry out for is that you would ever be growing our love and that you would grow that love by pouring it out from your own Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So let me tell you a story, and it's a true story. I have this mentor friend that is uh, one of the most celebrated ministers on the in the planet, particularly in the U.S. Uh, someone that has just been kind and immensely helpful to me. Um, an international minister, uh, mostly ministers from one place. But there was a time in his life when he was three times a month, he was going around the world and ministering. As part of a ministry team, he wasn't just doing this alone. He was going with some other celebrated ministers that really had the grace of God in their life in a powerful way. And they were speaking to pretty great crowds. Um, they would typically average 5,000 to 10,000 when they would speak to a crowd. And uh, this is, again, all over the face of the earth. After one particular meeting, though, he tells the story. He says, you know, I, uh, there was a van because there was a number in the ministry team. They traveled again as a ministry team. And there was a number, and so he was got out to the van ahead of everybody else after the meeting. And he was just sitting there in the van, and he started to cry. Just put his hands down in his head, and he was just sobbing. The Lord had really convicted him of something. And, um, you know, by that time, the lead minister and some of the others had come back into the van, and of course, it's, they just had this awesome meeting. God moved, was touching people. The preaching was powerful. The ministry was powerful. The worship was powerful. But here this blessed brother is, is just crying with his hands in his, or with his head in his hands. And they, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he goes, you guys, I'm backslidden. I just can't do this anymore. I'm a fake. I'm a phony. I'm a fraud. I, I can't do it anymore. And they were, of course, aghast because this is a guy that had a sterling reputation for moral integrity and everything. And he's, you know, just in tears confessing that he's backslidden. And they, you know, what's wrong? What's wrong? What, what did you do? Uh, what, you know, what, tell us. You know, what, you know, it, it, and, you know, they asked him, you know, is, is it some woman? Is it a money issue? Is it um, an addiction? Is it some hidden thing? He says, no, 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 no. It's none of that. It's none of that, but I realize that ever since I've been traveling with you guys, there's no grace upon my heart. I, I never cry in prayer before the Lord. I never weep tenderly before him in love. And I just, I feel like I'm just, I'm ministering out of a, of a lamp. I'm burning the wick, but my lamp has no oil in it. I, I feel like I've forsaken my first love and I just can't go on like this. 
But the thing in the story that I just think is maybe sticks with me the most is these other famous ministers just said, oh, you know, we, we thought it was a real problem, you know, as if it was, you know, the opposite sex or money or, you know, some hidden scandal or something. We thought it was a real problem. And he says, you guys, no, you don't get it. Forsaking your first love is a real problem. And I want to be released from this ministry team and go back and find my Jesus. And, and, and the long and the short of it is, is that they did that and he quit traveling with the team and he'll still a few times a year do something in the form of a conference, but for the most part, just ministers from his home base. I would say though, that the nations come to him to hear him minister. But he just said, I, I gotta get back to my prayer room. I gotta get back to intimacy with my Lord. Um, where did I wanna go with that? Here's where I wanted to go. Um, so there's a verse today, and if a lot of people were talking about love and the love of God, one of the first things they would say is, we need to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, our soul, and our strength. And that's true. It's the first and greatest commandment. The, in other words, how would I define that? After being born again, after being saved and receiving a new spirit by the Lord, having the old pass away and become new, having the darkness become light, having the death become life, the number one ministry that we will have for the rest of our life and on into eternity so a ministry that will outlast this life and into eternity is that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So that is massively important that we understand that. And uh, I just want to say that to the degree we live with a dull heart, to the degree that we live with a cold heart, to the degree we say it's not like it used to be, we're ships passing in the night, and we convince ourselves it's okay because I'm still diligent. I still show up. I can do a lot of things out of habit. I can do a lot of things out of duty. I can do a lot of things out of responsibility. I can do a lot of things just because they're right. But if that's us, as noble as that might be and commendable on one level, we're in a dangerous place when there's not a dynamic experience of first love, love to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, and the Holy Spirit interacting and going on in our life. Can you say amen? amen. That's a problem of the first magnitude. Now, I want to share some verses that will be kind of hard to share because they're difficult verses. It's like, Tim, oh my goodness, don't tell me you're going to bring difficult verses to a sermon called Loving God. I am. Just briefly, because I want to show how important this matter is. And so if you want to turn there, you can turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I have a number of scriptures today. Some I'll just point you there so you can see them in all the accuracy, and I'll just talk about them. Other times we'll all turn there together. But in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, if you unpack that, it essentially says, if there's no love going on in our heart, now that doesn't mean that love can't grow cold for a moment, but if there's ultimately no love in the human heart for the Lord Jesus Christ and for, and for our neighbor, if that's just, a, if that defines our life, in other words, the Bible would go so far as to say, well, one, there's a couple things true about you. It would say you're not born again. 
You have not been born of God if there's no love operating in your heart. Do you see how you can make that connection there? And it would also say another thing. If there's fundamentally no love vertical, no love horizontal functioning in your heart, it would go so far as to say, don't ever say that you know God because you don't know God if you're not operating in love. Now I know love can, I know love can get tweaked and I know love can get hurt and I know things like that, but if there's just a fundamental baseline of no love, the word of God would say, not born of God, do not know him. Now that's serious, isn't it? First Corinthians chapter eight, verse three, no time to turn there, but it says the same thing. I want to turn you to one verse, um, and I want to kind of move past it quickly because it's, I, if someone asked me, like, what's the most, uh, you know, beautiful verse in all the Bible, I might say John chapter 15, verse 9. If someone told, if someone asked me, what's the most painful verse? What's the most chilling verse? What's the most sobering verse in all the Bible? It's the one I'm about to share with you, but it has to do with the virtue of love. And 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. I would remind you that in 1 Corinthians is where we get the very definition of love, behavioral love, love as an action. But at the very end of that letter, almost the last verse, it says, I believe this, and I'm going to quickly say it and move on, but I want to show how important that if there's no love in the heart, that is a serious and concerning place to be. That verse says, if someone has no love for the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. And I just want to be clear what that means. That means eternally damned. To live without love is no small thing. And what it fundamentally means is that the God who is love, who can do nothing but love, who sends down radiant streams of love, it means that throughout a lifetime, his love has been rebuffed. His love has been denied. His love has gone unreceived. And just one more, even in the life of a believer when love begins to grow cold, Revelation chapter two, verse two, and I'll read this one, but if you would turn there, Revelation two, verse two, I think many of you will know this verse. Jesus to the churches in the book of Revelation. He praises them for some things in most cases, and then in most cases he calls out something that needs repentance. And in Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 2, Jesus says, I know your works. I'm going to count these out because these are praises. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil and have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know that you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you've not grown weary. I've often said that if I would just stop there and the Lord offered me a biblical resume, I would say, I'll take that. I'll, I'll go to heaven with that. You know, just like, give me that resume and let me go to the judgment seat of Christ with that resume. The judgment seat of Christ, by the way, that sounds, that's the reward ceremony. Let me go to the reward ceremony with those verses. No, I'll take that resume. But this is what's heartbreaking. What does it go on to say there? But, but I have this against you, 
that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from the heights or where you have fallen. Is it a small issue? Is it a stumbling? Is it a mere stumbling? A right, Marty reminded me recently when we met a righteous man falls or stumbles seven times, but what does he do? He gets up again. This is talking about a bigger word picture and you can get up, but from falling, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now I'm gonna move into some good news and some better news. I just wanna be absolutely clear though. Those ministers had in their mind what they thought would have been a scandalous sin. When he disclosed the fact that there was a, a, a choking off of love in his heart, they tried to pass it off as if, well, isn't that humble of you to say so? We thought it was a real problem, beloved. The choking off of love in our lives mm -hmm. is a real problem. Amen. It's a problem of the first magnitude. So having said that, how do we, that, you know, Re Revelation chapter two says it's something that can be repented of. Mm -hmm. There's hope offered. There's a remedy for this, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is good news now, but this is how this would unfold. If we're gonna be lovers of the Lord Jesus Christ with all our hearts, with all our minds, all our soul, with all our strength, both now and forever. This is like how that love grows or how that love manifests. It's not perfect, it's a vast subject, but I think I can point to three aspects of growing in that love. And I'll just pause once again because a hundred times, maybe a thousand times in my life, I thought about loving God with all my heart. And I just said, I'll do it, Lord. I'll just set my mind to it. I will just set my will to it. I will purpose to love you more. I see that this is the first thing. I'm zealous for you. I love you. It's not true in my heart, but I want it true in my heart. I'm going to do it, Lord. And uh, the Lord understands our heart in that, but that's not enough. Just, it doesn't fundamentally change our heart. Other things work love in our heart. It's somewhat counterintuitive. And the first thing is this. We can have a human kind of love towards babies. We can have, the Bible says that even the unredeemed love those that are their own, right? Loves those that are like them. So I, I do not deny that there's a certain human kind of love that can be expressed among people that are not redeemed. But if we're ever going to express heavenly love, God's kind of love, agape love, vertically back to the Godhead and horizontally to our neighbor, that love has to start with God. And so we'll never be able to manufacture or produce or live in that love unless John chapter three, verse seven is true. Do not be, do not marvel, I think it says. You must be born again. You have no hope of ultimately loving God and loving your neighbor, at least with God's kind of love, if you're not born again, if you're not 
If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus to be saved, if you do not pass from old to new, from death to life, from dark to light, there is no hope to love. In fact, the Bible says by definition, 1 John 4, 7, and 8, which we just talked about, that the one that does not love the reason it gives that there's no love is because that person isn't, hasn't been born of God and does not know God. So we need to come into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this definition of Jesus, how he talks about intimacy as a basis for salvation. We almost always talk in terms of faith, but let me just say it because Jesus said it in the form of an equation. He said, this is eternal life. In English, it would be semicolons, but you could imagine an equal sign there. This is eternal life. What, Jesus? What? What's your definition, Jesus, of eternal life? That they may know, that they may intimate knowledge. Is that knowing just the head? No, that's the intimate knowing there. That's the knowing with the heart. That they might know you with their mind and with their soul and with all their being. That they might intimately know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John chapter 17, verse three. But the one, I think this one is amazing. And to tell you the truth, I'm a little embarrassed to say this. I did not know this verse was in the Bible until yesterday. But it says exactly this point. And it's in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse six. And I think it'll make it absolutely obvious that we will never fundamentally love God and love neighbor unless God first moves upon our heart with love. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse six, it says this, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. In other places where he talks about that circumcised heart, it says he'll take away the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. But let me just keep reading. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and that you may, that you may live, that you may live. And there's a lot that could be said about that verse, but I hope we absolutely see it clearly there. The very thing that's being called for, to love God, to love neighbor, isn't going to happen if God's love doesn't first touch our heart. Amen? Okay, so if you've struggled and said, I don't get it, this love of God, this love of neighbor, and you feel like you've never had touches of it, then with, um, then with softness and love in my heart, I would commend you to say, stop trying so hard and just say, Jesus, the word of God says that you are love. Love me so that I could love you back. Come on me. Touch me. Change me in my heart. Change me in my spirit. Make me new with the principle of love so that I could love you back and love my neighbor as myself. It's called being born again. It's called believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And the reason you'll be saved is because when we faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, he does a work within us that's invisible, but he gives us a brand new spirit. He raises our dead spirit 
from the dead and gives it everlasting life, abundant life. And one of the principal features of everlasting life and abundant life is love. Amen? Amen. So, fundamentally, to love God and to love neighbor takes first receiving the love that God has for us. And we know that he delights to give it. That was last week's sermon. We know he delights to give it because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, that, are you included? Yes. Yes. He loves whosoever. Now the second principle in terms of growing in love for God and love to neighbor, I think is this. And it's what I started the sermon with last week. I'm just going to uh, reiterate here just a couple of things to illustrate this point because it's so important because most of you are born again and so your starting place isn't to get reborn again your starting place would be on this point that I'm about to talk about now if you feel that love is getting choked out or love is getting a little dull or dusty or or it's just not flowing like it used to then this would be the next step. And it's called 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. And that's one of the famous verses that tell us that God is love. But I'm thinking about the words that go before that. It says John the Apostle, referring to his Christian community, says, we have come to know, intimate knowledge, know, no, uh, ad, in, in, um, in married love, I just want to illustrate the, the idea of no for a second. I'm not trying to be stupid, but I want to illustrate the point. Adam knew his wife. When Adam knew his wife, what happened? Babies came forth, right? The point being is that no can be used in an intimate sense. Now, that was intimate husband and wife, but there's an intimate heart-to-heart -heart as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not being dumb. We're talking about intimate heart-to-heart -heart here. But we have come to know intimately heart-to-heart -heart, that God is love. We've come to know intimately heart-to-heart -heart, that God is love and to believe, to faith. That not only is in love, but that his love is for me. That I'm counted in his love. That his love is directed at me. So, for us to grow in love, now, now Annie and Matt's, oh, I said names, but on their wedding invitation, 1 John 4, 9. Amazing, I just think it's so cool, but I heard it yesterday, so it was fresh in my mind, but 1 John 4, 9, the principle that I'm talking about here in terms of growing in love is the principle of 1 John 4, 9. We love because we mustered it up, because we sucked it up and did the hard thing. We love because we first experienced his love. We love because he first loved us. Beloved, it, it takes God to know God. It takes the love of God to love God. That's a, that's a paradox. It's a seeming contradiction, but it's the truth. Because Father means source. God is love. He is the source. The fountainhead of all love is who? God. And if we're ever going to share or participate or experience love, the, the source of that love is who? God. If we're ever going to love him back, the love has to come from 
from him. And just my silly illustration, I might have even shared this in a sermon recently. I know I shared it with a couple of friends. Christmas time on the bus downtown by Dayton's and Donaldson's. And I said, Grandma, I love you. I want to buy you a Christmas present. It costs $5. Grandma, can I have $5? Well, sure, Timmy. She gives me $5. I went and bought the Christmas present, and it was under the tree, and I gave it to her. Was Grandma blessed? She was blessed. But that's how we love God, beloved. That's a picture of how we love God. I want to love you, God. I want to love my neighbor. Well, then I'm going to give you some love so that you have source or so that you have resource to do that with. Amen? Amen. And so we want to grow in love to God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. We start meditating. We start thinking about. We start watching Hallmark movies that show some of these principles we start thinking about the way that God loves us. About the way that God loves us. We start thinking about the fact, and again, I did a little devotional on this, but I said, you know, God's almighty, he's most high, he's judge, he's righteous one, he's sovereign Lord, he's king of kings, he's all these different things and hundreds of more titles. But the principal way that he delights to manifest towards us is what? As a father. So that says something about his love, right? Aren't you glad that his principal manifestation towards us is not judged? Now, he is a righteous judge. Nothing will ever change that. But aren't you glad that's not his principal relationship with us? His principal relationship with us and forever will be Father, which means source. And so we start thinking about things that are manifestations of his love. How is that a manifestation of his love? Because the scripture tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, what manner of love has the Father bestowed on us? So clearly he sees this as a manifestation of his love. What manner of love has the Father bestowed on us that we should be called his children and consequently he is our father and not just father, he's our Abba, which means that he's the most endearing, tender form of address when we say, in fact, my buddy Chris Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. That right there. So we start thinking about things like he's our father. We start meditating and setting our heart to the fact that, again, this is so hard for guys to get their brain around. But you know how women calls the sons of, like when the Bible talks about the sons of God, are the women included? Yeah, they're included. When the Bible talks about the bride of Christ, are the men included? They are. Hard to get your brain around. But the principal way that Jesus, for all eternity, delights to know us is how? As a bridegroom. That says something about love, doesn't it? Doesn't it? How about the Holy Spirit? Paraclete, that's the Greek word. It can be used, helper, comforter. I love this one, though. I just love this one. I mean, I love comforter maybe the best, but I love this one, too. One way that we can translate that word, not me, like smart people that know Greek, one way they translate that word is advocate. Mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine? You have an advocate that lives in you, and that advocate is God. That's pretty good, isn't it? That gives a whole definition. I mean, a whole new level of revelation to I've got your back and your shoulder and your knee and your heart and kidney and your mind. 
I am your advocate against the accuser of the brethren. Amen. So we start thinking about things like that. We start thinking about the fact that Jesus was our propitiation, our wrath absorber, our, our, uh, our acceptable sacrifice on our behalf. We start thinking about the fact that he doesn't just love us in some kind of a mental kind of dutiful love, but that he delights in us. We start thinking about the fact that he disciplines us in love, but the point to his disciplining us in love is that he is so skilled at it. It is his way of making sure that he who is faithful to begin a good work in you will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. We start thinking about the fact, and this is why I said John 15, verse 9, because this is a transformative meditation when we set our heart to it, that Jesus loves us. He loves us. Oh, that's cool. That, that is cool. You know how he loves us and forever will love us? With the same love that the Father loves him with. The same love that is shared amongst the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the same love with which they love us. What is that? What is that? That's why heaven is forever because that part of our inheritance will be ever unfolding throughout the epics, throughout the eons, throughout the ages. Amen? Amen. And so we start thinking about that. We start thinking, and I think I'm inventing this word. We start thinking about the fact that his love is initiatory. But it's the idea of this. His love will be forever pursuing us. I mean, you do enough marriage counseling or couple counseling. I just wish he pursued me like he used to. And your heart breaks. You feel that. That's real not Jesus. He's ever, forever pursuing us. Never, ever, and on into eternity, there will be no drop off in his pursuit of us. Amen? And that he never gets distracted. Our bridegroom, Jesus, our Father, the Holy Spirit, they never, ever, ever, have ever, they do not now nor ever will ever get distracted and lose focus on loving us. Nothing will ever get in their way. You'll never have to say, Jesus, come on, come on, come back to me here. I'm pouring my heart out to you because he's not distracted. He's all in every time. Amen. And um, we love because he first loved us. Now, turning, oh my goodness. It's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna close with this. I'm gonna close with this, and then I'm gonna make this 2B. Two, two, this is 2A. Two 2B two will be next week. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about what it, next week, we're gonna talk about what it is to love with our mind. What, you know, and specifically like what that kind of means, what it is to love with our soul, what it is to love with our strength, what it is to love with our heart. We'll save that for next week. But let's close with this little part. So we're meditating on all those different ways that the Father loves us, that the Son loves us, that the Holy Spirit loves us. Now, how does that translate into our love for God and our love for neighbor? How? Turn in your Bibles to one of the most exciting verses in all the Bible. It's, it is the sanctification. If you only knew one verse on sanctification, this is the verse to know. So that should make it cool. Like If you wanted to boil sanctification down to one verse, this would be the verse. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 
And if you wanted to boil being born again down to one verse, it would be 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. But we're talking about sanctification here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. So we've just done all this meditation. Wait, he's father as his primary manifestation towards me. Wait, he's bridegroom as his primary manifestation towards me. He's advocate as his primary manifestation towards me. He's always initiating. He's always pursuing me. He's never distracted. It's an everlasting love. It's not till death do we part. It's I will betroth thee to me forever. And so we start meditating on things like this and here's what we're doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, and we all, the beloved, the born again, those who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, those that have trusted in Jesus for salvation, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, his beauty, his attributes, his virtue, his splendor, the way that he loves us, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So we meditate on all those ways that the Father loves us, all those ways the Son loves us, all those ways the Holy Spirit towards us. That's what we're doing. We're gazing on his excellencies, we're gazing on that, we're thinking on that, and inside us by the Holy Spirit, what's happening? We're being transformed into the same kind of love. It, in other words, we want to better manifest as a father towards our children. Now we want to manifest as a better bridegroom towards our wife. Now we want to manifest as a better advocate towards the beloved, towards our brother and sisters in Christ, etc., and so on. By meditating on the way he loves us, we're being transformed into that same kind of love. And thereby, we can love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. And with the overflow of that love, we can love our neighbor as ourself. Amen. Amen. And as ourself is important there, because we'll never outlove a love that we feel for ourselves. It sounds selfish, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound selfish? Here's the classic one. I forget who said this, it was a famous minister. Lord, I, I want to love my neighbor as myself. And the Lord said, that's the problem. You get it? That's the problem. You don't love yourself. You don't love yourself. You haven't drunk deep of the, my love for you. You haven't received my love for you. You haven't been filled up with my love and thus love yourself, and how are you ever gonna love someone else or ever love me back? <coughs> and so, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, we meditate on those things of love that the Lord exhibits, and we're changed or transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Philippians chapter 1, Verse 9, that your love may abound more and more. And that's the other exciting thing about it, is it never has to end. There's always another iteration of glory. There's always another glory to receive. Amen. So we'll save some of the specific ways that we try and grow in love related to mind, related to soul, related to heart, related to strength for next week. Heavenly Father, be with your people today. I ask that you would do, again, a, a triple down on this one, Lord. Tripling down. I pray that you would do Romans chapter 5, verse 5. That the love of God 
that your love would be shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you today.